Good evening, everyone. Um, oh, thank you. And welcome to the Thursday, September 8th, 2022 regular board meeting of the Board of Trustees. I'm now calling it to order. We'll start with a roll call. Uh, Trustee Canova is absent. Trustee Fairchild? Here. Trustee Gonzalez? Here. Trustee Lieberman? Here. Trustee Ratterman? Here. Trustee Ryan is absent. And I am here. Okay, next we'll have the introduction of interpreters. And I appreciate before you do that, that we've changed it from translators to interpreters because that is the right word. So for oral translation, right? Do I get that right? Okay. So yes, thank could... you so much. <laughs> Go ahead. Good evening, board. Buenas noches. Mi nombre es Verónica Adams Navarro. Angélica Benitez y yo seremos las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida por el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en la parte inferior de su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En este menú también puede seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next up is our Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Waisaki, would you mind leading us? Thank you very much for um, leading us tonight. Next up is our district mission and vision statements. So the mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences. La mission del Distrito Escolar Unificado. Are we good? Okay. Uh, the mission of Santa Clara Unified School District is to provide equitable, engaging, and innovative educational experiences so that each student thrives in a global society. And the vision is that graduates of Santa Clara Unified School District are resilient, future-ready, lifelong learners who think critically, solve problems collaboratively, and are prepared to thrive in a global society. Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda. Motion to approve, Rotterman. Second. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Rotterman, the second from Trustee Lieberman. Any comments? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, that passes six to zero with Trustee Canova absent. Uh, next up is public comment on our closed session agenda items. Do we have anyone in the room who wishes to speak on a closed session item? Okay, anyone on Zoom who wishes to speak? Nope. Now is the time to raise your hand if you're on the Zoom, if you wanna comment, if you are on the live stream, you need to join the Zoom. One last check. Okay. Then in closed session, we'll be talking about B.1, discussion regarding expulsion of student 090822A.1. B.2, public employee discipline dismissal release. B.3, public employee performance evaluation of the superintendent on special assignment. And B.4, one item of significant exposure to litigation uh, relating to a complaint. And uh, we'll be back at approximately 7.30, 7.45, something like that. Thank you.
That'd be absolutely amazing because yeah. <laughs> so that's what's happening with that. Back to the nails. How about that for a little bit? I am using, like I said, I digress, which is so gorgeous. It's got the slightest, and I mean slightest shimmer to.
Are we um, good to go on the live stream? Okay, thank you. So we are uh, coming back from closed session for our September 8th meeting. And um, our report from closed session uh, is that um, in, uh, let's see, this would be B.1, In the expulsion case of student 090822A.1, the recommendation of the hearing officer is that the student be expelled with a suspended enforcement through September 8th, 2023. Student 090822A.1 can apply for reinstatement at the end of the expulsion term, September 8th, 2023. The motion was um, voted seven to zero with a motion by Trustee Gonzalez and a second by um, Trustee Ratterman. Uh, for item B.2, the board discussed. Item B.3, the board discussed and gave direction. B. Okay. B.4, um, the board uh, discussed. Can I have the introduction of our interpreters, please? Good evening, board. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es Angélica Benítez. Mi compañera Verónica Adams y yo vamos a ser las intérpretes en español de esta noche. Bienvenidos a la reunión de la mesa directiva. Esta reunión está siendo transmitida en el canal en español de Zoom. Para escuchar esta sesión en español, oprime el botón que dice interpretación en su pantalla y seleccione el idioma de español. En ese menú también podrá seleccionar la opción de silenciar el audio original en inglés. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, next up is the report from our superintendent, Dr. Waddell. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, we have had a busy transition into September with a lot of positive energy and activity around the district. Um, yesterday, we had our retreat day for our newly constituted district leadership learning team. This team is focused on a, uh, a collaboration uh, and it consists of executive cabinet, UTSC leadership and members, CSEA leadership and members, principal representatives, uh, SCFT leader and President Muirhead was with us as well. Uh, it was a full day of reviewing the strong and noble traditions of the labor management partnership in our district, envisioning about where we're headed as we jointly sh set shared directions forward. Uh, this team of about 22 individuals will meet monthly through the year, and it's very exciting to see this work that's been done since the, this work began so many years ago and to imagine what's possible in the future as well. So it was a very exciting day. Um, last week, our general administrative management team met, and we began focusing on a couple of our district priorities of empathy and respect. We spent some time in conversation and shared meaning making and discussed the connection of empathy and respect to our desired outcomes of creating welcoming and belonging uh, climates across the district. This team was led then in a talent protocol activity by Director Allard and had a really good afternoon of reflection and shared learning. September is preparedness month. This is a good opportunity for us to be re reminded that public safety is our highest priority. Um, we've been reminded recently of the tragic events in Uvalde, Texas, um, and, and those, those events have come back to the forefront of our minds. So thanks to the strong partnerships with our local police departments in Santa Clara, San Jose, and Sunnyvale, we're in the midst of staff training and drills for the National Run, Hide, Fight protocol used by law enforcement, schools, and businesses across the country. Last week, our local police chiefs and I sent a district-wide letter to all families around our shared commitment to these critical components of preparedness. Families will receive alerts from their school principal ahead of each school's drill. Drills allow the staff, students, and police to practice their training. This morning, our first drill was held at Bookser Middle School. Police um, partners shared overwhelmingly positive feedback with Principal Ponzio and expressed that they were impressed with our staff and students throughout the exercise. Chief Business Official Scheel was present and may provide additional comments when he makes a report this evening. While we wish these trainings and drills weren't necessary, I'm appreciative for the collaboration and professionalism of staff, communities, and partners. Additionally, as we think about safety, we're pleased to have seen slight cooling late this week, but dealt with the heat events since the end of last week. 
I have to commend the sites and staff who brought their best creativity and work around keeping students hydrated and cool to the greatest extent possible. Our maintenance and facilities team and Chief Shield are to be commended for their proactive work and quick response as the situation developed. Our data and assessment team are preparing for the upcoming release of the California Dashboard. As you know, the California Dashboard reports on how districts and schools are performing on multiple state and local measures that make up the California Accountability System. These results are used to identify strengths and weaknesses and help ensure that the needs of all students are met. In prior years, the dashboard reported levels using the colors blue, green, yellow, orange, and red. And these performance levels were based on two years of student data uh, showing both status and growth from the previous cycle. Due to the requirements of Assembly Bill 130, the, the, dash, the California Department of Education can only display the most current year known as status this year on the current dashboard. Therefore, compared to prior dashboards, performance levels will not be reported until we, uh, we're setting, we're resetting the baseline and then we'll move that forward. So as we're just beginning to analyze data, we'll be bringing more detailed information to you in the future, but I wanted to uh, tell you that we're, we're monitoring that closely. We're continuing recruitment efforts specifically for hiring paraeducators, FCE staff, transportation, food service, and other specialties. We encourage the community to visit edjoin.org or indeed.com to apply for these essential positions and become part of the SCUSD family. Um, the, uh, regarding COVID, the CDC's community risk level assessment for our county lowered last week from medium to low. So that's very good news. The new bivalent booster uh, vaccine is available, also referred to as Omicron booster. This new booster will be distributed to healthcare providers and community-based pharmacies to re replace the original COVID-19 booster. SCPHD announced on September 2nd that its mass vaccination locations and clinics are prepared to administer the updated Moderna and Pfizer boosters. And I understand the county office is standing up uh, vaccination clinics as well. So we'll hopefully have those dates soon. We will follow the county recommendations. The bivalent booster shot should provide greater level of defense against COVID-19 by targeting the original strain of the coronavirus, as well as the currently dominant Omicron BA5 variant. Um, that will be available, the Pfizer version will be available for people 12 and older, and the Moderna booster will be available to individuals 18 and over. Uh, I just had to call out a couple of the opportunities I've had to visit sites. Um, in the last couple of weeks across the district. I was very pleased to visit Pomeroy Elementary School and walk the campus with Principal Keegan. It was a delight to meet some of the staff and students and see the positive energy and creativity apparent there. I was particularly impressed with the maker space, the cooking cart and the gardening opportunities that students have a chance to interact with. I also had the opportunity to visit Bracker and was really so impressed with the collegial spirit and warm climate and family feel of the school and the, and the commitment of, of the staff there. It was very nice. Um, I, I visited uh, also New Valley Continuation High School and heard about the awesome engaging ways that the staff is approaching the curriculum and supporting students in credit recovery and creating positive relationships in a welcoming environment. And I can tell that great things are happening for our students there. Um, the other day in the heat, I visited the Benton campus to observe the meal distribution that occurred and was just very impressed with the staff that was managing the operation, even on a very hot day. As you know, we have offered food distribution since 2017 in partnership with Second Harvest Food Bank. The food is brought to the Wilson, Wilson campus in boxes and staff then bag the produce, as well as organize the perishables and other items, milk, eggs, frozen meats, rice, etc., Recently, the district farm has begun providing some seasonal organic vegetables when available. Staff are responsible for organizing and the distribution setup that includes communicating with families, check-ins, traffic control, and cleanup. This year, the FRC has provided food to 365 families and 639 students in August and September. Uh, this happens on the second Tuesday of the month. And I, I think this happens because of the dedicated FRC team. Uh, it's supported by our custodians, campus supervisors, adult education staff, and other student services staff. And I must commend all of them for their great work that is in service of our families and communities. 
I'll end today with a somber note. We will fly flags at half staff on September 11th as we mark the 21st anniversary of the terrorist attacks on the World Trade Center, Pentagon, and United Airlines Flight 93. We also lowered flags to half staff today in honor of the death of Queen Elizabeth II. A proclamation from President Biden noted that Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was more than a monarch. She defined an era. In a world of constant change, she was a steadying presence and a source of comfort and pride. She led with grace and unwavering commitment to duty and the incomparable power of her example. Her legacy will loom large in the pages of British history and in the story of our world. Notably, Elizabeth was thrust unexpectedly into a position of tremendous responsibility in 1952, a time when women didn't have access to many mentors to hone their leadership skills. Her reign spanned 15 British prime ministers and 14 U.S. presidents. She managed to be many things to many people. She was a wife and mother, eventually a grandmother, always appearing at ease in that role, and earned the respect of the world leaders and maintained the dignity of the monarchy into the modern era. I know that we all honor the memory of, of her as well as those that we lost on 9-11. And that concludes my report. Thank you very much for all that information and the, and the um, words at the end. Appreciate it. Um, so the next item is E.1, report from union presidents. Ms. Villarreal is heading to the mic. Good evening, trustees, Dr. Waddell. Can you make sure the mic is on? Huh? Is the mic on? It's on. Okay. Smooth though, it's usually. How's that? Okay. I'll start again. Good evening, trustees, Dr. Waddell and President Muirhead. I hope you all had a wonderful Labor Day, even though it was hot. I'd like to start off with a shout out to our nutrition services staff. They have been working diligently to serve healthy meals to our students. Since August 11th, they have been averaging 2,400 breakfasts and 83 lunches per day. That means that since the start of school, they have provided approximately 214,000 meals. And I get nervous when I'm having a few guests for dinner. That's quite an accomplishment. Um, the staff in our elementary sites have been helping our kindergarten st students learn how to navigate the school cafeteria. They prepared lunches early for the first three weeks of school so that their teachers could bring them over to learn how to stand in line, choose their food, and be educated on how to make good nutritional choices. The kitchen at Wilson, yay, was finally reopened with our post-secondary and independence network students assisting the kitchen staff, which is a win for our staff and a win for our students. And post-secondary students are also assisting at the Booker Kitchen, for, Bookser Kitchen, four days a week. Books are post-secondary, four days a week, I just said that. Utilizing state training funds, the nutrition department was able to send seven people to Napa for culinary training. They learned skills there that they will be sharing with other staff and were able to collaborate with five other school districts from across the state. And finally, this is really exciting. Our own Carol Flores Aguilar, known as Gabby, the satellite cashier at Scott Lane, along with Karen Luna, is going to be interviewed tomorrow by Civil Eats, which is a daily news and commentary blog about the American food system. They want to learn about her experience as a pre-apprentice in the Chef Ann Foundation, whose mission is to ensure that school food professionals have the resources, the funding, and the support they need provide healthy, delicious, cooked from scratch meals that support the health of our children and our planet. We have two more classified employees applying to that pre-apprentice program again. So much good stuff happens in the kitchen. As I mentioned before, our executive board had an all day planning meeting on August 26th. We accomplished much on that day, setting our plans for the year and discussing where our members can support the three district priorities, becoming proficient to support the use of data to improve adult practices and student outcomes, becoming effective collaborators to focus first on students historically underserved to close the opportunity gaps, and developing strong members to be part of highly performing teams that innovate and make an impact. We are also making more effective communications a priority 
and our communications officer, Edson Sanchez, and committee member, Monica Verdone, created our first newsletter in over two years. And I have copies for each of you. And I invite you to check out our beautiful website, CSEAChapter350.com. I get wonderful feedback from CSEA all over the place saying that we have the best website they've ever seen. So check it out. We're still in negotiations. In my last report, I talked about the need for job security and living wages for our student attendants and paras. Tonight, I want to discuss our library media assistants or our LMAs. And I add that this is a carryover from last year's negotiations. We're still working on it. Some of our LMAs only work 3.7 hours a day or 18.75 hours a week, yet most of them continue to work much more than that. One LMA told me that last year she recorded her extra hours and it came to about 500 hours without compensation, which I told her to stop doing. But this is ridiculous and unacceptable. They provide so much more than just checking in and checking out books for students. They prep for classes, specific needs. They open children's minds to a whole new world with the stories that they read and they share their love of books. Not to mention that new tasks keep getting added to their day with no hours being added. They can't keep dividing 3.75 hours endlessly. There has to be a better way for the district to meet the commitment to students. And for many of them, the school, many of our students, the school library may be the only exposure they ever get to the rich and valuable resource of literature at libraries. This concludes my report. Yes, Bonnie. Um, civic, civil eats. And you'll notice I didn't have time to mention the giants so that I'll have to leave out my giants report. Have a good day, a good night. Okay, thank you. And do we have two of you coming up? You only get five minutes total. I'll do it one. Two, two for the price of one tonight. Uh, good evening, President Muirhead, Dr. Waddell, and Board of Trustees. My name is Ian Jackson, the UTSC Vice President. Our report this evening will be given by both myself and President Waisaki. For the first time this school year, we are excited to share a few UTSC shout outs with you. Last year, Leanna Goldberg nominated Laura, Lauren LaRocca as STEAM Teacher of the Year with a local organization many of you know, RAFT. RAFT's STEAM Teacher of the Year awards recognize outstanding pre-K through 12 teachers in the Bay Area who incorporate effective hands-on learning and or maker education into their curriculum. Each awardee demonstrates excellence in teaching in at least one of the following areas, science, technology, engineering, arts or math. Ms. Goldberg stated of Ms. LaRocca, Ms. LaRocca supplies her students with real application of STEAM lessons and gives her students agency in her classroom. In addition to supporting her students, Ms. LaRocca is also a key resource for her fellow teachers. She has been a key contact for our teachers learning computer science and coding specifically. Another recipient from last year was our former UTSC member from Don Calajon, Brian Williams. Mr. Williams was nominated by our EdTech Tosa, Stephanie Rothstein, in her application, Ms. Rothstein wrote, Brian Williams is an incredible instructor and shares freely. Whenever I visit Brian's classroom, students are fully immersed in design thinking process. In addition, he is really thoughtful in providing students with true engineering opportunities and helping them to learn and grow. While Mr. Williams has moved on from Santa Clara Unified School District, we do want to give him his just time in the spotlight. We wish him the best of luck in all that he does. Our third recipient is Margie Wysocki. Her principal from Hughes Elementary School last year, Joe Young, recommended her for this honor, stating, Miss Wysocki has taught fifth grade for many years as she has transitioned and as she has transitioned to third grade, she continued to understand the benefit of incorporating educational technology into her lessons with the third grade students. 
She successfully shifts her instructional practices to match and meet the needs of the third grade students. Ms. Waisaki consistently engages her students in coding and robotics year after year, no matter their age. Congratulations to our UTSC members for their hard work and for the staff who took the time to honor them in this very public manner. RAFT will celebrate the STEAM Teachers of the Year at their annual fundraiser, CSI RAFT, on September 22nd, beginning at 6.30. Thanks, Ian, which is why you have two. Um, as you've heard tonight, uh, many of us were involved in the 2022 reboot of the DLT. UTSC is very optimistic about the work before us, and we're ready to roll up our sleeves and get to work. Change can be difficult and a bit uncomfortable, but it can also be the precursor of consistent growth. We will revisit commitments made in the past, but more importantly, lean into the work before us as we hone our partnership and our systems. We wish you a wonderful evening, cool evening in this monstrous heat wave. Thank you and have a good night. Okay, thank you very much and congratulations to those STEAM teachers. Uh, next up is E.2 public health update, including COVID-19. No, nothing further, okay. Then next would be uh, item F, public comment on unagendized items. So this is a time for the public to comment on something that is not on the agenda. Is there anyone in the room who wishes to speak on unagendized comments? Okay. If you are out on the live stream, you need to join the webinar in order to comment. So if you're on the webinar and you wanna speak on unagendized comments, now would be the time to raise your hand. Okay, seeing none, we will move on. Next up is G.1, public comment on agendized items. So this would be a chance to speak on something that's later on in the agenda, but you don't wanna stay for it. You wanna comment now. Anyone in the room who wishes to speak? Okay, and is there anyone on the webinar who wishes to speak? Okay, then we'll move on. Next item is the consent. Can I have a motion? Motion to approve, to approve Rotterman. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Rotterman and a second by Trustee Gonzalez. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero. Do, do, do. Moving on, uh, I.1, resolution number 22-40, September as Attendance Awareness Month. Can I have motion a motion? Motion to approve, Rotterman. Okay, we have a motion from uh, Trustee Rotterman and a second by Trustee Gonzalez. Uh, is there any comments? Any public comment in the room or on Zoom? Okay, seeing none, we'll go ahead and vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes seven to zero. Item I.2, resolution number 22-43, National Hispanic Heritage Month. You have a motion? Second, Rotterman. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Gonzalez and a second from Trustee Rotterman. Any comments from the board? Just point of order, is our resolutions required to be roll call? I think they are. Oh, yes, they are. Okay, so we'll do, we do this the one. vote on the first one. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll do this one first and then um, and then I'll go back. Okay, so we're um, we're still on I.2 National Hispanic Heritage Month. Uh, is there any comments, any other comments by the board? Any comments in the room or any comments on Zoom? Now would be the time to raise your hand. Can you turn on your mic, please? I can, I'll, let, I'll let this be at the president's discretion, but but oftentimes in the past, the president might, in some cases, depending upon the resolution, might read the resolution. So, but I leave that up to the president. Okay, you have to um, let me know that you're interested in that ahead of time because I don't have it up. Um, so in the future, yeah, help, help, me, help remind me ahead of time and, and we can make sure that that's up and available. Okay, then we'll do a roll call vote. Trust, oh. Do, do you, would you like to read it, Trustee Lieberman? You have it up? Okay, then why don't we start with uh, National Hispanic Heritage Month.
Uh, Santa Clara Unified School District, resolution number 22-43, affirmation of September 15th as the beginning of National Hispanic Heritage Month. Whereas Santa Clara Unified School District is honored to join citizens throughout the country in recognizing September 15th, 2022 as the start of National Hispanic Heritage Month. And whereas every year since 1968, from September 15th to October 15th, our country has celebrated Hispanics, Latinx culture and contributions to our community and nation. And whereas each year Americans observe National Hispanic Heritage Month by celebrating the histories, cultures, and contributions of Hispanic Americans whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And whereas the 2022 theme for National Hispanic Heritage Month, Unidos, Inclusivity for a Stronger Nation, encourages us to ensure that all voices are represented and welcomed to help build stronger communities and a stronger nation. And whereas this is an opportunity to share the historical contributions of Hispanic Americans that have significantly impacted education and pioneers such as Roberto Alvarez, whose groundbreaking case, Roberto Alvarez versus Lemon Grove School District, 1931 was the first successful school desegregation case in American history. And whereas throughout the year, we honor the contributions of Hispanic Americans in our history, as well as celebrate the contributions of Hispanic Americans who serve our communities and schools every day, such as civil rights trailblazers, Eva Blanco Macias, Cesar Chavez, and Dolores Huerta, after whom our new Dolores Huerta Middle School was named. And whereas Hispanic Latinx students make up 33.8% of the SCUSD student population and 39.3% of the Santa Clara County student population and represent the largest racial ethnic group among the state's child population. And whereas within Santa Clara County, there are programs to assist Hispanic Americans, such as the New Americans Fellowship, a leadership pipeline for DACA recipients living, working, or going to school in the county, school-linked services, a partnership between Santa Clara County and schools to bridge supports and services such as health and well-being, and the Universal Access Pilot, a collaboration of first five Santa Clara County agencies, Santa Clara County Office of Education, and other nonprofit partners committed to cross-system coordination and integration in service to family navigation that is culturally responsive and applies a whole child, whole family approach to supports. And whereas other partnerships have been formed, such as the Hispanic Education Foundation of Silicon Valley, which provides support to students and families through programs such as Latinos in Technology, STEM, parent engagement, and leadership development. And whereas SCUSD in its effort to honor National Hispanic Heritage Month and to enhance equity and diversity remains dedicated to providing resources and programming for Spanish speaking communities, offer translation services and training for staff, schools, and district departments, continues recruitment efforts to attract diverse educators into the teaching profession, promotes multilingual education, and continues to support safe schools and resources for undocumented students. And where, whereas in resonance with the 2022, 2022 theme, Unidos Inclusivity for a Stronger Nation, Santa Clara Unified School District recognizes the significant contributions and considerable advances that Hispanic Americans have made and continue to make each and every day in our community, state, and the world as leaders, politicians, educators, and public servants. SCUSD looks forward to the continued partnerships that uplift Hispanic Latinx students and helps prepare them for a bright, innovative future. And whereas SCUSD remains committed to serving, inspiring, and promoting student success while improving student equity and access to high quality education. And whereas SCUSD encourages teachers, other staff members, students, families, and the community to use this opportunity to honor the contributions of the Hispanic Latinx population through student-led activities and inclusive curriculum. Now, therefore, it, therefore, be it resolved that the adoption of resolution number 22-43, affirmation of September 15th as the beginning of National Hispanic Heritage Month, the SCUSD Board of Trustees recognizes National Hispanic Heritage Month and its commitment to this year's theme, 
Unidos, Inclusivity for a Stronger Nation, passed and adopted by the SCUSD Board of Trustees this eighth day of September, 2022. Thank you very much. You do that very well. So get ready to do the next one. <laughs> You know, I'd like to suggest the next one be read by Jim. I think he'd be really good at that. In front of me. We'll get you a copy. I, <laughs> but thank, thank you, Bonnie, because, and again, you know, it's up to the president, but I think a resolution like the one that was just read needs to be heard. And so, that was really beautiful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Sure. I, I appreciate that. You hear enough of me in a meeting, so I appreciate Trustee Lieberman reading I'm that for us. <laughs> okay, so this was um, I.2. National Hispanic Heritage Month. So we'll do a roll call vote. Trust, Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I'll say yes. So that passes seven to zero. Okay, so now we need to go back to I.1. Resolution number 22-40, September as Attendance Awareness Month. Um, and you also wanted this one read, is that right, Trustee Canova? It, it's long. You, are you up to reading it, Trustee Lieberman? I, I would like to make a recommendation. I mean, all of the people on the board have read these. It's published. Anybody can read them. And I do appreciate, you know, I, I think the last one was particularly appropriate, but I would like to streamline our meetings a bit if we could and move forward. So again, it's up to the discretion of the president, but I would say let's vote. Okay, go to school. That's basically what it says. Okay, so we have a, a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a, and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. And um, we're gonna do a roll call vote because it's a resolution. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I also say yes. So that again, it passes seven to zero. Next item is J.1 MOU with C CSEA chapter 350 for maintenance and operations night shift. Do I have a motion? Motion to approve, Rotterman. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Rotterman, a second from Trustee Lieberman. Any comments or questions? Any comments from the public? Uh, if you're online, is there anyone online? My comments, thank you for working it out. Yeah, okay. Let's okay, go. I see no hands up, so we can go ahead and vote. Uh, the motion was from Trustee Ratterman, second from Trustee Lieberman. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero. Item J.2, Career Catalyst Program Agreement with the Foundation for California Community Colleges, Chef Ann Foundation. We have a motion to approve. Motion to approve, Ratterman. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Ratterman and a second from Trustee Lieberman. I think it's um, wonderful that we've got uh, this funding for our nutrition staff to do training um, throughout throughout the year. So um, anyone from the public who wishes to comment or anyone online who wishes to comment? Nope. Okay, then uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero. Next up is K.1. Resolution number 22-41, adoption of the 2021-2022 recalculated GAN limit and establish the 2022-2023 GAN limit. Motion to approve, Fairchild. Second, Rotterman. You gotta speak up. Okay, so we have a motion from Trustee Fairchild, a second from Trustee Rotterman. Any comments or questions on this item? Any members of the public who wish to speak? Or anyone online? Okay, then um, it's a resolution, so we'll do a roll call vote. Trustee Canova? Yes. Trustee Fairchild? Yes. Trustee Gonzalez? Yes. Trustee Lieberman? Yes. Trustee Ratterman? Yes. Trustee Ryan? Yes. And I also say yes, so that passes seven to zero. Next item, K.2, 2021-2022, unaudited actuals, presentation and report. Can I have a motion to approve? Motion then, to approve, Ratterman. Second. Okay, and then we'll go to the presentation because I can see Mr. Scheel is lined up and ready. So do we have his presentation up? And before they do that, I will um, bird walk slightly a little bit and go back to something that Dr. Waddell said earlier today. I did have the pleasure of being at Bookster Middle School for the drill that was there today. And 
Um, I think I told the law enforcement that was there as well as the staff that in our debriefing meeting that it could not have gone better. Um, it was, you know, we don't want to do these types of drills. Uh, we don't want to think about needing to be prepared for these types of events. Um, but I, I, I want to say thank you to the staff and the students on that campus for doing an exceptional job of um, the training that we are doing this year in the drill. It, it could not have gone better. So I just wanted to say thank you to them. Um, so with that, um, I will start my presentation. And uh, as a reminder, uh, annually, we um, bring this presentation to the board uh, before September 15th for the prior fiscal year, which ended on June 30th, and staff have closed the books, and this is the uh, final work of that before we turn it over to the auditors and produce the audited financial statements. Um, I am happy to report um, our total revenues um, ended up being $339.5 million, and you can see the breakdown on the screen. Uh, comparison, most notably of our property tax revenues, which make up the lion's share of our uh, unrestricted revenues, and a comparison to the 2020-21 school year, uh, above the black line for our total ongoing revenues, you can see that we had a very slight and modest increase this year of about 3.4%. Our secured roll taxes did increase uh, slightly. I, th I think that percentage is around 4%, 4.3%, if I re remember correctly. Um, our countywide growth uh, for 2000 uh, for the last year was 3.11%. So we outpaced the, the rest of the county, but um, it was definitely down from where we are in prior years when we typically see somewhere between a 7 and 9% growth. Um, the offset there was, uh, as you can see, a decline in unsecured property taxes, as well as our ongoing RDA. We saw a decline in both of those. Uh, not surprising, considering all of the appeals um, that were happening last year, and I have more to talk about that in uh, later in the presentation. And then also you see below the line also is uh, uh, we received no one-time revenues last year in property taxes, uh, contrary to prior years. And so um, obviously the change there is a negative since we didn't receive any. On the expenditure side, you can see total expenses were 329.4 million, uh, broken out between those individual areas. Um, certificate uh, salaries and benefits uh, make up the largest portion of our budget. I, if, again, I believe that percentage is around 87 or 88 percent of the total uh, general fund budget. And then there you can see that as the result of that, revenues minus expenses show a $10 million surplus last year, but uh, unrestricted was only $600,000. The lion's share of that uh, change in surplus was in our restricted fund balance, restricted resources that we received in that weren't spent during the 21-22 school year and will be spent during the 2022-23 school year. And so those are included in the restricted portion of the fund balance. Speaking of fund balance, uh, we did set aside the required 3% minimum reserved. We also, uh, in our assigned fund balance, have the 7% uh, basic aid reserve that the district has set aside for many years, as well as the remaining balance of five and a half million previously set aside of the equity and intervention reserve. Uh, we also have uh, our site department and targeted carryovers of just under 3 million consistent with past practice. Uh, we've identified some technology needs for future year uh, in this coming year of 1.5 million. We have a big textbook or a, um, a big technology replacement project uh, this coming year that we need to take care of. And also, uh, as the board knows, safety and security is a big component of something we're doing this year. And we've identified some safety and security needs. We'll be bringing those back to the board, uh, more information about that at future board meetings. And then you can see there a restricted fund balance of 18, just under $18 million. So a significant amount of restricted resources uh, that we will be spending um, in a wide variety of time periods. Some of them don't need to be spent until 2025 or 2026, but we're working on a plan for all of those uh, uh, restricted fund balances. Uh, this slide here is one that you've seen before, but it's been updated. Uh, based upon this information, uh, the unaudited actual, we finished 2021 with about a 59.7% reserve. Uh, we're finishing 21 22 slightly better than where we thought. Originally, we thought we were going to have deficit spending this year. As I just said, we had a $600,000 surplus in the unrestricted general fund. And so that switch changes it from a 50% to 54% reserve where we finished 22 23 
I did not update all of those percentages in the out years. Those are specifically from the, um, the most recent budget presentation. We will update those with the first interim report in December. So I have some additional just one time uh, analysis. Uh, this is a follow up. Um, you know, uh, Trustee Rotterman asked for this analysis last year. And so um, my team and I really thought that this analysis provided a, a nice picture to show of the revenues of the total 339 million. Uh, we backed out those one time transactions so you can actually clearly see what is that that's ongoing as opposed to those one time revenues that are come in. So this year we received just under 17 million or just over 17 million dollars in one time revenues this year. Whoops, forgot to advance it. There you go. And then we also did the same thing on the expenditure side as well. And you can see that of the 329.4 million, we had uh, just under $19 million in one-time expenses this year throughout a wide variety of the budget uh, uh, categories. Um, lastly, um, I have some other information um, that doesn't really pertain to the unaudited actuals, but it is timely information that I thought I would take this opportunity to share uh, with all of you. First is on the property tax revenue update. We were notified after the adopted budget, which is not the time when we would want to have heard this information, but we have found out afterwards from the county assessor's office that the Santa Clara Redevelopment Agency has paid off all of its debt. And so in accordance with the appropriate sections of uh, human resources, or uh, it's, not, it's not even government code, it's a specific code in California law, um, those redevelopment agency properties leave the RDA area and move into the typical secured, unsecured property tax area. And so that is going to be happening this year. Um, and so in a meeting that I was in, I think two weeks ago tomorrow, um, they provided this information for us that what we will see is in the RDA revenue category, we will see as of right now, a decrease of $26.6 million. And we will see an increase of 23.3 million in the secured for a total net change of a decrease of 3.3 million. Why? Because RDA revenues are taxed slightly differently through the pass through process than on the secured process. And as the result of that, it shifts things and we will actually see a little bit of a net decrease when those parcels move out of the RDA area into the secured. Everybody follow me so far? Okay. But with that less than great news, I have some positive news. And that is that um, so, far, so far our um, secured revenues are outpacing what we thought we were going to see uh, based upon the preliminary information that we had in June. Secured revenues so far are outpacing that original projection. So you can see here, whoops, I forgot to advance it. So you can see here in the second uh, table, in the second is, what we projected for secured revenues represented a four and a half percent increase from 2021-22. And so far we're at 9.4%. And so that is a positive development that we, so far what we're seeing is that secured revenues are, um, are, are we're seeing a significant uh, revenue growth at this point in time. What you can also see in that bottom line there is, um, and I'll kind of walk you through that. In the second column, you can see the total projected before the adjustment in RDA of $53.7 million of total secured revenues. You can see that movement that the revised is gonna be 27.5 million with the extra 23.3 million moving to secured. So what you can see here is as you're looking all in compared to 2021-22, you can see a five and a half percent increase compared to the 263.9 where we finished last year. So it is a little bit of positive news and I wanted to go ahead and use this as an opportunity to share that with you. As you remember in our original adopted budget, we anticipated deficit spending. So this will help solve some of the deficit spending that we're anticipating for the current year. And we will continue to monitor this. Uh, we have another meeting, I think in October or November, we'll have another meeting with the county assessors to get another update with that. And then we will incorporate those changes into our first interim report. I do wanna say though that, um, we need to continue to be mindful of the appeals that is going on, are going on. And so I just have some updated data for you. In August, through August of 2021, there were 937 new appeals filed. And the, this is countywide. So this isn't just in our, our, our area. 937 new appeals for a total value of 431.7 million. 
We've had a little bit of an improvement. So new appeals filed through August 2022 were only 864. So again, we saw a little bit of improvement in the number of appeals, but the total value of those appeals was 431.1 million. So a difference of only $600,000. The other thing to be mindful of is those are just the new appeals. Through August 31st, there were a total number of active appeals countywide of 6,737 for a total requested VAT or a total value of $89.2 billion. So I just wanted you to have that uh, some context information. And with that, I will take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for all that detailed information. I see um, Trustee Raderman and Trustee Canova. First, let me thank you for putting the report in there for me on the one time that was fantastic. I really appreciated that. Um, I had a topic that affects our, our budget, uh, particularly in the RDA. And I don't wanna get too much in detail with it because it potentially has some legal issues. But as you recall, uh, Cedar Fair has sold Great America for 310 million. Initially, they were able to buy that through the RDA with the idea being that that was restricted land. Therefore, it had a reduced property value of around 100 million. Um, they netted a $200 million profit. Um, that profit theoretically could have come to the taxing agencies, including Santa Clara Unified School District. So there may be nothing about this that's improper, but there is a risk that there could be. Um, and so I would like to see us make an inquiry with the county. I think county council helped us with that in the past. I would like to see us make an inquiry as to make sure that everything was done properly and there are no pre-agreements or anything that might have, uh, I mean, 200 million is a lot of money and I would like to see that in our, 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 that's money that had that property sold at market value instead of reduced for a, for a fair would have been uh, money that this district would have had to spend. So, or at least 36.8% or something. That's it. Is that a reasonable request? You, yes, you know, that I, I've already started working on it. Okay, great. Can't get in front of Mark. He's he's on top of everything. Yep, not surprised. Um, okay, Trustee Canova. Yeah, Mark, you talked about it in the past, but um, efforts in Sacramento to bring back some type of RDA of some sort. Do you is that still on your radar? Is that still occurring? Where do you see that going? Yeah, so um, that would require a change in state law. Um, there have been some rumors and you know flutters about it, um, but really no traction as of yet. Okay. Um, I had a question about the RDA mm -hmm. that you said that things were moving from the RDA to secured, mm -hmm. but are there still any RDA properties left in the Santa Clara RDA waiting to be sold? I don't believe so. Um, in order for to wind down the RDA, there's two conditions. One, the properties have to have been transferred and sold and two, all of the debt has to have been, um, been repaid. And so through that process, it would indicate that there are no properties left, but um, it's a great, I, I can't speak 100% to that, so I will uh, find out. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Trustee Gonzalez. Thank you. Just as far as the uh, one of the uh, appeals from uh, the uh, San Francisco 49ers, I know that's in the courts. I think, mm -hmm. do we have any visibility as far as when that might be getting um, dealt with? Or They're finally? in a snail's like pace right now. So, no. All right. I do know that there is a similar case going on in San Francisco County. Um, and so that one's a little bit further through the process than ours currently is. Um, but no, I haven't heard an update as to where all of that is in the process. But this has been going on at the snail's like pace for the two years that I've been here and for before that as well. And I guess the last comment I would make, I, I know that we've uh, gotten some community benefit from some of the the properties that have been developed within the, the district. And I would assume that we would, uh, you know, advocate for that if, if and when uh, Cedar develops that property there. Yes. Yeah, we'll continue to look into that. Absolutely. Especially since we need some property there for a new school, right? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Okay, any uh, questions from the public or comments? Anything um, on the webinar? Now would be the time to raise your hand. Okay, seeing none. 
we'll move on. Thank you so much. Good news. We need to vote. Oh yeah, we need to vote. That's right. So we had a motion from Trustee Rotterman uh, and a second from Trustee Lieberman. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero. Next, we have L.1, consideration of the waiver of administrative hearing regarding student 090822A.1. Do we have a motion to approve? Motion to approve, Rotterman. Okay, we have a motion from Trustee Rotterman and a second from Trustee Gonzalez. Any questions or comments or from the public in the Zoom? Okay, then we will go ahead and take a vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That passes seven to zero. Next up is M.1 2022 Summer Programs Presentation and Report. Ms. Canelo. Okay, I'll wait for a second while they bring my slide deck up. Um, good evening. And uh, I'm here to share with you some wonderful work that went on this summer. You have a full executive summary um, in the document. So I'm gonna to try to hit some highlight, highlights and not, not uh, belabor too much, but really just share with you the successes that we had this summer. So um, this is a slide with the pre-K through five summer programs. And um, we're very thankful to Bracker, Hughes and Laurel Wood staffs for uh, letting us um, come into their spaces during the summer and provide um, programming for our students. We ran uh, both math and literacy intervention programs there, as well as our extended school year and um, our English learner and migrant programs. And we did a really good job on all of our programming this year to blend everything so that things just, there wasn't an ESY program over here and um, you know the, the literacy over here and the, the math over here. Um, what we did this summer for our elementary program is that we added PE, art, and library for all of the students that were participating in the elementary program, which really gave a well-rounded program, kept the students engaged in their learning in, in a lot of different ways, just not the, just the math or just the literacy intervention. And it really gave us the ability to help students continue to grow over the summer. Um, and provided opportunity for continued growth and engagement, especially for our students. All of our programs tar targeted our students who were um, potentially underserved, especially during uh, the pandemic years when we were distance learning or when we had some students back, but not all, and, and just all of that time that not necessarily did they lose instructional time, but the, the quality of instruction just having to be online so much and also suffering just from being out with illness and stuff. So it really gave us a chance to offer extended time to all of our students in the elementary. For our middle school programs, I wanna thank the books or staff um, for allowing us to come into their space and, and use their space for our students, for all of our students. And uh, this program always is such a um, joy to plan because, um, you know, middle school, they don't really, you know, they'd rather have their summer probably. And they also aren't getting necessarily, they're not getting credits for graduation. So to entice them to come, uh, our staff has been so incredibly creative. You could see some of the programs that were offered. And um, we, all of those have some, academic instruction running through them, whether it's oral language or um, written language or technology skills or computer science skills, all of that is kind of running through those programs. And many of you got to see and experience their learning through the culminating activity that they had at the end of the program. So um, we had a great summer program for our middle school students as well. And then in high school, <laughs> This slide kind of says it all, 7,719 credits earned by our high school students. And that spans all of those programs from our English learners and our migrant students to our students um, that might be there for extended school year. They were all earning credits toward graduation. So that is amazing, especially considering um, some of the struggles that we did have this summer. 
And then on top of our three uh, grade level span programs, we have some other programs that are just, just incredible and happen every summer. Um, Wilson really allows for their students to continue the independent study during the summer, which for some of them is so important to stay connected and to continue to earn credits toward graduation while they're um, you know, working or doing other things to support their families or just struggle with sort of our co comprehensive environments. Um, and then Max has been doing a great job the last couple of summers uh, in a summer bridge that onboards their ninth graders and also allows students to take some college courses during the summer. Also to improve um, and to kind of expedite their way to their graduation and, and beyond. So um, I wanna thank both of those staffs. They run their, pretty much run their own programs um, and they do a little bit of hiring if, if they need extra people, but um, really it's about their students and, and those programs, which uh, really is great to be able to provide for those um, alternative programs where things might be a little different for them and their needs are different during the summer. Um, we also ran our SEAL and YMCA programs, which are smaller programs. Um, YMCA has always written a grant for Scott Lane, which is our highest um, socioeconomically disadvantaged school. And so they always run an excellent summer program that's sort of education and camp, which is a lot of fun. Um, and finally, I wanna thank our final, final family child ed um, programming. Our fee, they had fee-based programs and some of the camps that they ran included our summer um, Simmer Stew Bake It Too, which was a culinary uh, camp. And then also an annual, our annual farm to table camp that was actually out at our farm. And one of the things that I want, that I really appreciate is that they are learning how to make sure that the opportunity for all of our students, regardless of struggles that they might have getting onto the farm, getting off the farm, being at the farm on a day, that we are willing to, we're finding ways to accommodate every single child that wants that opportunity, even if they're that, you know, they have the restrictions of mobility of any kind, we're finding ways to um, provide those opportunities for them. So they've done an excellent job and they had many more camps. Those were just a couple. Um, and just um, to bring this to your attention, oftentimes targeted is where we spend most of our money for um, our summer programs. However, as Mark was sharing, we have a lot of one-time money. And, and the ESSER money, in particular ESSER 3, is particularly targeted for programs like summer. It has a spending time limit. And so we did use much of that one-time money for our summer programs um, this summer and actually last summer too so that we make sure we are using that, uh, utilizing that funding in the time that we have it. And then I don't need to read this list to you, but this is a list of wonderful celebrations. But I want, what I do wanna say um, in the last bullet is that this happened through a very difficult time because of the coordination and collaboration of all the hosting sites and especially every single department at our district office from child nutrition to transportation to payroll to HR. I mean, I, I would forget someone if I tried to list them all, but every single department outside of course of our learning department, which really spearheads that piece of it, but it took every single department to really provide the, the programming that we did this summer. Um, we couldn't have done it without everyone. Here are a few of our struggles and we had reported these before our staffing, that was just a really difficult time. And I don't wanna end on the struggles. I just wanna say that we're thinking about these as we begin to plan for, for um, next summer. And uh, we are gonna do that very soon. So in October, we will start our very first meeting. Uh, we meet particularly with the teaching and learning staff first, just to say, okay, how are we gonna coordinate programs? What do we need to do? We are inviting our um, our labor manage our labor partners in uh, our leadership team to start those conversations early on, so they can help us um, figure that out and figure out the struggles that we may have had and enhance our programs even more for our students for next summer. 
And then around December, we ask all of the departments to join in because we start doing things like looking at all the sites that have construction, figuring out where we can best place sites for the summer programs, working with nutrition to see which sites could get free uh, meals for the summer and things like that. So there's so much to work out. So they'll join us in December when we start hiring the admin so that we're kind of ahead of the game. And what the admin that step up, which are generally teachers, always say to us every year is, can you start earlier? Because there's so much to do. So we keep trying to start a little bit earlier each year. Um, and then finally, we have set the dates. And just one thing I wanted to point out is that we will be um, reserving and, and honoring uh, Juneteenth this year. On June 19th, there will not be summer school, which we haven't done before. So um, I am happy to report that. And I know um, our members will also appreciate that, that do work during the summer so that they have can honor that holiday as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, just one, yeah, I see two, uh, Trustee Ryderman and Kenova, but I just wanted to ask one quick thing because we always get this question from parents. When are you gonna publish the dates? I saw you have the dates for next summer. Are those up on the website already? Yes. Great, thank you. Um, Parents, I hope you appreciate that. Okay, Trustee Ratterman. So you've done an amazing job with these programs and I've heard and I've gotten a lot of compliments about what's been happening, et cetera. You may have done too good a job because the one thing that is not exactly actually negative, but the people have asked for, matter of fact, I just happened the other night, I had several you know, high school students ask me, um, the programs we have right now are for extended day school, which is again, kind of a recovery process and also credit grade recovery. Um, and so there is a need or a want, maybe is a better way to phrase it, for uh, enrichment or advancement um, from a lot of students that want to take classes so they can arrange to get a different elective or something else in the regular school year. And I realize that there's a huge budgetary issue. Um, but I was curious if we've had any conversations about that and if it's something that maybe we should entertain as a conversation down the road. Uh, to see about maybe for next year, if that's possible, or if it's just, there's just no way to do it. There's a lot of complicating factors in that. One being that I will speak from an educator point of view is that honestly, a course of a semester long course of 120 hours of instruction squeezed into a summer has the potential of having very shallow learning compared to very deep learning that our teachers can do in, in a full semester or full year course. So um, that's something to really think about. Oftentimes we're allowed to get in what we need because it is the second time students are seeing the material when you're taking them through a quick six week course. We still do the same number of hours technically but honestly, they're sitting through six hours of instruction per day for six weeks. So I, I would say that's one of the biggest challenges. I think our students have the opportunity to take their own classes in high school outside of our um, outside of our venue, which might be a college, a mission college course, which then would still have that rigor just by the way they run the class. Um, and it's different. So it's something obviously can always be explored. However, you're also correct about funding is that typically our summer programs are for to really target those students that need that extra support. Okay. I'm not saying no, I'm just saying those are some of the things that we face as we discuss things. Like I realize that. it was a uphill, uphill issue and, and we've, it's come up many times before and we've always, budget was one of the big issues that we ran into. And you know the concern about the deep learning was something else that's come up. Part of that request was not just to do a course, but to do something um, uh, to enhance what they've already learned. Like, for instance, one time in high school, I took a short course in scientific instrumentation during the summer. Um, and that was great. It wasn't part of the regular curriculum. It was just gave me extra information. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I think it's something that I would love to see us have some conversations about because it, it's also an opportunity for some of those kids to really excel and do something that they're excited about and keep that, that love of learning going. Thank you. Sure. Okay, Trustee Canova. 
you know, I always hear a lot about summer school and very good things about it. My, my wife's in child nutrition. She always participates in summer school. She loves it. She says, actually, it's a very exciting vibe from the students, you know, in summer school. And, and again, as you say, the, the, those are for recovery. But there are students that are, that are also trying to advance as well. Um, I would want to see us to uh, give the budgeting necessary to make summer school as robust as possible. Uh, we've talked about recovery post-pandemic. But also just looking to the future, you know, when you compare the United States to Western Europe, to Japan, to other parts of the world, our school year is significantly shorter than the rest of the world, significantly shorter. So we should really make our summer school a really robust option for not just a recovery, but advancement, make the budgeting available. I, I recognize the time constraints in terms of how much advanced material you can put into such a tight little time frame. Some things may fit, some things may not but find what does fit and put it on the menu. Just mm -hmm. put it on the menu. And let's make sure, you know, as a governing team that we get the funding needed so it's there. We are here for the students. That's what this is all about. And uh, we want them to catch up and we want them to move ahead. And so summer school is a great vehicle to get it done. Nice report, very impressive. So let's okay. put more money behind it. Trustee for Chuck. Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, thank you for the report. I know that summer school is a lot of work and what makes it very difficult is, as you said at the beginning, is staffing. So when I hear, oh, let's expand, let's expand, sometimes it's hard to even fill those positions. And so my question to you that I, I wonder, as I hear my colleagues say, well, we need to throw more money at it, is do we need to pay more for summer school teaching for summer school paraeducators. Para now, of course you're saying yes, but when we're having a hard time, having been one who has taught summer school, who has worked on the assessment team in summer school, um, sometimes it's a little shocking how much less you get for summer school, at least back then. I haven't done it for several years. Um, and so I, I wonder if, if we're having trouble with staffing, if that's something that we need to look at is what we are paying um, those teachers be and the paraeducators and everyone else, because oftentimes that gets reduced in the summer. Yeah, I, you know, we haven't had staffing issues. Well, of course, COVID was very different. Prior to COVID, we never had staffing issues. We usually, sometimes we even had to do interviews or, um, you know, people ha were prioritized in our contract. So we'll have to see if that sort of normalizes after all of this, but um, it is it is something to think about. I think our teachers, you know, this past summer, teachers and classified staff, and even the administrators, like I had to twist arms and actually call favors to get anyone to step up as an administrator. And in fact, you'll see in the report that we had two brand new, our, our new, um, special ed coordinator and our new special ed program specialists that were brand new. The district hadn't even, I mean, their contract was supposed to start August when everyone else started and they came on early to help run summer programs. So I just think it was a unique year in that situation. And so we'll watch it as it normalizes. Um, we, I think teachers enjoy, um, some of them enjoy stepping into other roles and other um, content areas and other grade level spans during the summer. And so sometimes it's just that sort of refreshing step into something different. And then hopefully our classified staff, we will continue to be able to have more. I mean, we're still short now, so we'll have to see how that happens. So we can explore all those options of how we make sure we have a strong staff this coming summer. And that's another reason for starting so early, just to really strategize and be creative about how we might uh, make sure that we can serve all the students that need it because we we were not able to serve every student that wanted or needed summer school this summer and that was um, heartbreaking for many of us so we're hoping to get back on track with that thank you so much um, that was a, a lot of good information I appreciated the executive summary so that we didn't have to bombard you with questions so thank you I just want to thank you for the report. I, I know it's really uh, well done and we, we do have a lot of options. And I think your last comment as far as not being able to, uh, to to provide for those who needed it, 
interesting is something that maybe we, uh, as we look at our, our you know, kind of bringing down our checking account or what have you, um, this one-time money I think is, is used, uh, can be used for, for things like, you know, that are not ongoing such as summer school. I think that doesn't something um, as far as funding is something that we can definitely use at, at students who need the uh, extra time, instruction time that can benefit from that. Um, and I think um, as far as, uh, you know, having it, I think in the past we have had issues bringing and had to bring in folks from other districts to, to help us out. And I think, we, you know, it's probably had them float a little bit and we've had some better years, but, but how do we, uh, you know, maybe starting early like we're doing today is is a good thing to uh, to get more uh, more staff on you know from within the district to uh, to be a part of the uh, teaching and learning and uh, uh, classify folks that are going to be there as well. Um, now I was just going to say, um, as far as uh, it's all especially for operationary teachers, it's always great to get them more experience, right, and get them in, into the classrooms and making sure that we can provide the PD maybe even before summer school, if we have to, to some of those uh, teachers and uh, folks that are gonna be in front of our students. But, um, but yeah, I think uh, I think the board has always been really receptive as far as providing what we need for our students. And and definitely, uh, you know, we don't have a limited budget, but I think we do have, you know, resources to, to hopefully, hopefully provide for those students that need that extra instructional time for, uh, and I think I mentioned in the past that sometimes it's, it's like almost like you got to go and, you know, transportation, pick them up and make sure they get there. And I think that's something that, uh, you know, what we got to do and kind of get the, the, the parents on board. But uh, if it's needed, I think it's something that can be beneficial for them. Okay, well, um, thank you very much for the report. I, um, I, really like how many students were involved. Um, it's good to see with um, all the extra work and the uh, ELOP ex and extended learning opportunities. The, 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 yes, the, the, well, the ESSER money, and then in the future, we're gonna have this other money. And yes, and, we've, and this is all one-time money and um, in, uh, increasing our opportunities in the summer is a way that we can um, make a difference for our students with some of this one-time money that isn't ongoing. So um, I think that that's a, a great use of that um, funding is to increase the opportunities for our students year round and including in the summer. So that's great. Um, any other questions for, for Ms. Knievel? Is there any um, comments from the public or on the Zoom? Nope. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so um, we are up to items from the board. So uh, we'll start down at the end. Trustee Ratterman. You like to make me first, that's cool. I, I, um, no, I, was, I like to I was first. thinking about the other end. I can go from the other end if you want me to make I know, I'm, I'm okay, we can okay. do that. You know, this is an uplifting time. Um, there are times in the year that aren't, but this one really is. Uh, we're doing the back to school nights, we're getting out, I'm getting to talk to students, I'm getting to talk to teachers. Everybody's excited and enthusiastic. This is just really a positive time in the school district. And everything I'm hearing is that things seem to be going really, really well. Um, I tell you, I, I ask students, um, I have a set of questions I like to ask students. And one of them is, uh, if you have a magic wand, you could change anything, what would you do? And some of the answers that come back are, one of them I actually talked about earlier, they wanted to do the summer school program, okay? Uh, another one was that it was interesting, it was split. Some of them love block schedules, some of them hate block schedules. Um, it used to be when I asked this question, the number one issue was food. I want to change the food. It didn't come up a single time this time. So congratulations, Nutrition Services. You're doing something really, really right because these kids live, I mean, that's their life is eating. Um, and so it was good. There was a couple of negatives. Uh, one of the elementary schools, the student told me if they could change anything, they would like to get rid of the fencing. And I said, oh, well, why, why do you not like the fencing? He says, I feel like I'm in prison. Now we need the fencing. We need, we need to have the ability to secure the school, but maybe there's something we can do to make it a little less um, institutional. 
Um, at any rate, it's been really positive. I also had the opportunity to work with, um, uh, I've been, I'm the exchange director for um, the, the Rotary and we've got a couple of kids that one that just left yesterday for Spain. It's gonna spend uh, 10 months over in Spain. Um, phenomenal young lady. Uh, we have a gentleman, a matter of fact, he just gave a presentation today uh, and um, he has come in from India. And these kids are so smart and so bright. And you get a chance, if you're a teacher, you get to see that. But as a board member, you don't always get to see and experience just how phenomenal these kids are. So anyway, it's a, it's a lot longer than I normally talk, but I just, this is a great time of year. So thank you very much. Trustee Canova, go ahead. Yeah, I'd just, just like to start by saying, thank you, Gary. I'm hearing so many positive things and so just really really grateful for your leadership and um i just wanted to put that out there um i'm a student of history i love history so much it's just one of my favorite subjects and today with the passing of queen elizabeth my gosh i mean you're talking about seven decades i mean that is probably before most of everyone in this room i would say because you're talking 1952 is that correct 1952 i believe i think that's what gary said earlier and um, so that's just phenomenal. I mean, just think about that. I mean, that is incredible. So what happened today with our passing is a very major historical thing. You know, where will the UK go now? How will that be? I can only imagine how the, the folks in the UK must feel. I know Michelle spent so much time in the UK. I'm hoping she might say a thing or two about it because you have so many contacts there. But, um, but just what a historical uh, moment. Um, just, just, just wanted to put that out there. Still processing it because I learned about it on the way over here, but just just what a historical moment. Uh, just uh, I I wasn't here in person um, uh, the last meeting right after the start of school, but I've heard great things about the start of school year. Thank you to everyone putting in the effort, and then I've also been really I I remember actually um, glad we've actually been able to put air conditioning into. I don't think that's my time actually. Oh. It, 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 no, no, it's not. <laughs> oh, I thought you meant during your time on the board. Did you no, no, sorry. Yeah. Anyway, um, uh, I remember when my son, uh, who is now a college freshman, was in uh, one of the early grades, first or second grade, and talking about how we didn't have air conditioning, and you know, it was like his description of it was like war zone. Uh, you know, kids passed out in the hallway. <laughs> so. I remember thinking, being very relieved this week that we had been able to upgrade uh, our, our um, air conditioning in, in the schools so that uh, at least it was a little bit better than it was uh, back when he was an early, uh, early grade student. So, and, but I'm hearing again, also great things. So thank you so much. Trustee Lieber. Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, just um, a shout out to Wilcox High. I was at back to school night last night and um, super cool. The food trucks, there were so many people. It was, it was really, really fun, um, even in the heat. Um, and I, I have a newfound respect for high school students. I, I don't know how you walk from class to class because I was done at the end of that thing. Um, I was hot and sweaty and I wasn't carrying a backpack full of stuff. So you were late for a lot of I was late because <laughs> I couldn't find some of the buildings. So, um, mad respect for you guys, sh um, schlepping all your stuff as you navigate through the campuses. Um, and also, um, I am a new, um, water polo parent. So, um, uh, sh I just want to say uh, shout out to Wilcox and Santa Clara High water polo. Um, they played today at Santa Clara um, and um, Wilcox played Fremont on Tuesday. Um, so um, I'm learning a lot about a sport I know nothing about. Um, and I just pretend to know what they're doing, but it's super fun. And they're amazing athletes, these kids. I don't know how they tread water, but um, yeah. So. Um, that, I think that's it. Yeah. And like everyone said, I'm hearing great things too about the start of school, particularly about Dr. Waddell. Um, so thank you for your leadership um, and uh, stay cool. Uh, Trustee Fairchild. 
Thank you, President Muirhead. Um, I was thinking about the air conditioning too, remembering when we didn't have it. And I don't know if anyone remembers that it was Miss Amber Watt who brought the air conditioning discussion to the forefront. And um, thank you, Amber. I think everyone thanks Amber this week. My kids thank Amber. We bless Amber for the air conditioning that now exists in Santa Clara Unified. Um, I also wanted to say, I got a very exciting text message from Michael McWalters. I don't know how many of you know him. He's the husband of Paul Larson. They were at the McDonald um, uh, VIP tour. And Michael, and I know that our district staff did as well, took it upon himself to pester David Cohen's office about removing the graffiti that was on the abandoned buildings on the other part of the property. And he sent me a picture and it has been covered up. So he was very excited. And so I wanted to share that news. Um, I was able to attend. I have to say, I think I might have the coolest trustee area. No, I'm just, we, all the trustee areas are awesome, but every single one of my schools had food trucks at their back to school nights. So just want to say to, um, principals out there and staff that it is definitely a way to increase attendance. Fabulous um, back to school night at Bracker. Um, Dr. Waddell and I were there together and it just had such a good vibe. It was so wonderful. And I was able to attend the next morning um, to just see their lunch and had a wonderful muffin provided by Mrs. Canova. Um, Cabrillos, I may be partial, both of my girls are there. Their back to school night was excellent too. Again, food trucks. Are you sensing a theme? Come to trusty area three. And then Will Cox, as she said, had four. Trustee Gonzalez. I'll just keep it short today, but just uh, as far as back to school nights, it's been really, uh, you know, nice to go back and see a lot of the staff and and, and parents running around. And uh, I found it to be really well attended from parents. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a positive thing. Uh, one, one thing that uh, was posted to me a couple of weekends ago, and I, I, I saw it the other night on, uh, I think it was Nightline, but it was as far as uh, the teacher shortage and how do we get more teachers. Uh, you know, Santa Clara University has a SEMIA program, which is like a seed, right, SEMIA. And um, how do we grow our own? I think it's one of the beneficial things as far as uh, our districts we've always had organic teachers that you know have gone through our, our uh, district and come back and i think that's always a highly positive whether they're teachers or educators classified whatever capacity i think it's always nice when they're from our community teaching our community and giving back to our community so um how do we find and work with our our staff or our teaching staff to maybe um even highlight that and uh maybe kind of grow some seeds within our our students to to see them come back and and become teachers. Okay, and then um, I had a couple of things. Uh, one, I think it's been kind of interesting that there have been um, a few articles in various papers around the state talking about teacher housing, and every one of them mentioned Santa Clara Unified and how we are leaders in this space um, because we've had our teacher housing for so long. So I'm very proud of our district for being at the forefront of that movement. And now finally, 20 years later, or however long it's been, other districts are realizing the importance and um, doing work in this space. I uh, Last board meeting, I mentioned about elementary back to school nights. And so this time it was high school back to school nights. Um, I thought uh, Wilcox with their food trucks was brilliant because it just brought the community in and I think the parents were as excited to see each other and the kids were excited to see each other. And it's like, oh, and by the way, there's a back to school night. Um, so I thought that that was a really cool vibe that um, that was going on there. Um, I also went to Santa Clara High for the other half of that same night and um, got to wander into some classes and hear what some teachers are doing. And uh, that's always exciting because there's a lot going on in our high schools. And then earlier I attended McDonald High School's very first back to school night. And that was just so cool because, well, first of all, everyone is creating everything from scratch. So there, you know, there were posters up about leadership and the ninth graders are running for president. And the teachers are saying, well, 
you know, I'm, I met somebody over at Santa Clara University. And so we are partnering on something. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. You know, they're, the teachers are really getting into finding innovative ways to teach, to go with the innovative classrooms that they're in. And I talked to some kids who are super excited. The ninth graders were giving, you know, showing directions. You're saying about walking. They were giving the directions and some parents were wandering around just talking to people and, and teachers. I got a chance to talk to some teachers while they were didn't have kids in the, uh, parents in the room. Um, just a really great vibe. And then just one last thing is I did go to the DLT retreat yesterday, the district learning team. And I'm really excited to be part of that this year and um, bring the board perspective to that team as we look at priorities for this coming year. So that'll be good. Okay, then um, let's Motion see. Motion to, to adjourn, Rotterman. So the next uh, two board meetings, September 22nd and then October 13th are coming up. So uh, Trustee Rotterman, I made a motion to adjourn. You had a second. Yes, I heard it. I was just saying. I didn't even get it out of my mouth. Okay, Trustee Ratterman um, has uh, made the motion to adjourn, and uh, Trustee Lieberman was the second. So, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, so that passes seven to zero at eight fifty-six. <laughs>